Well, we begin our meditation on God's word in the name of Jesus, dear Christian friends. Well, this world around us and all the created universe, it can be a very, very beautiful place. But it can also be a very scary place. On the one hand, it is indeed a beautiful work of God's hands. The creation indeed is his handiwork. It it should be completely obvious. God should get all the credit when we look around at our beautiful world that we live in. And summer is the best time to go out and enjoy this creation of ours. I'll never forget when I was first given the opportunity to see the northern lights, really prominent too, in the sky. I'll never forget too when one time at summer camp I was able to get out in the country away from all of the city lights. I was amazed at how many more stars are in the sky at night. Yes, this world is a beautiful place. But then all of a sudden it seems that nature can bear its teeth on little earth, sometimes in the form of storms and earthquakes and accidents. And suddenly this beautiful place becomes a very scary place. I was at the park yesterday, and it was a really nice day. I'm sitting at the picnic table with Mike Gerges, and we're talking about things. And before you know it, somebody was mentioning what happened a few weeks ago with that young man who, who died on the railroad tracks over here recently. As things can be going along wonderfully, but then all of a sudden... We feel the effects of sin in this world and the storms of life and circumstances of life can overwhelm us. Before we know it, it's a scary place. Many of you probably heard too what happened with Jerry Smith this past week. One moment he's out and he's enjoying a wonderful summer day with his family. They're camping up north, but then before he knew it, Jerry had an accident on his bicycle and is severely injured and is in the hospital in Wausau. We'll be praying for him today. And it goes to show you how this beautiful world can suddenly change very quickly. And it can become a scary place. It causes problems in people's minds. And it raises questions and doubts. Can I really trust God? Is he really good? And if God is really good, then why are all these things happening? And then when it really gets bad, people can even begin to doubt if he is really out there at all, and if he exists at all. Well, God certainly doesn't want us to end up in that place. God really wants us to have answers to questions in life when this world that's so beautiful around us becomes a scary place Your God wants you to know by all, beyond all reason, that he indeed cares for you. And the Gospels are a really good place to go to see what God is like and to get answers. To get a foundation for your faith and an anchor for your soul. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they they all show us that Not only did God leave his footprints all over the creation, but he also left his footprints right here in history. The one who made all things is the same one who stepped into our world and walked among us for a while. Jesus came to reveal God his Father to us and to remind you, us, and all the world that he really does care for us you. Well, the setting for our text today takes place out on the Sea of Galilee. It's not really a sea so much as it is a a lake, and kind of a a small lake, really, about 13 miles long, about 8 miles wide. The disciples get into a boat with Jesus on the Sea of Galilee. boat's probably about 30 feet long. Eight feet wide, five feet deep. We kind of know that just from history and archaeology. Back in 1986, they actually unearthed a boat like Jesus would have 
been in that day in the Sea of Galilee. There were some some months of drought that had kind of caused the, the shore to be exposed more. And, and there, there it was. There was one of those boats, likely one like the one Jesus was in. Not a very big boat. Again, would hold about 15 people, crew of five. And another interesting factoid about the Sea of Galilee, not too far away, about 30 miles northeast, is, is Mount Hermon. It's about 1,900 feet high. And when the westerly winds come sweeping down its, its slopes and then collide with warm air over the Sea of Galilee, well, you can imagine. It's not really good for little boats. Well, the disciples are with Jesus in that little boat. When we're told in, in verse 37, and a furious squall came up. The wind or the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Again, you can imagine, I'm painting a picture here for you, for you, but there's like 12 guys in this boat, including, and then Jesus, eight foot wide boat. You can see the disciples furiously struggling with the oars, fighting this losing battle against the wind and the waves. And, and all the while, they're fearing for their lives. What's Jesus doing? Tells us in the next verse, Jesus is sleeping in the stern on a cushion. It's what you do when you're tired, right? Surprising the things that you can sleep through when you're that tired. Plus, Jesus knows a few things or two that the disciples are forgetting. He's... He's the creator of the wind and the waves. He knows they've forgotten. Jesus also knows that he's not going to die this way. They should have known that too. Jesus gave them a promise that they were going to be fishers of men. They should have known this isn't the way it's going to go down. And Jesus wasn't going to die here in this boat with 12 guys either. He knew he would die on a cross at Calvary. That was the Father's plan. And so Jesus... He's tired, and he's sleeping. Meanwhile, the disciples are frantic. Teacher, don't you care if we drowned? Teacher, they called him. And surely that was a title he deserved. He was a respected rabbi, a, a master teacher. But you and I know he's not just one out of a group and then he just happens to be better than the others in that group of teachers. He's not just part of the group. He's God. From the very first lesson in God's word today from the book of Job, we were reminded of just who that Jesus is. He's the one who shut up the sea behind the doors when it burst forth for, from the womb. And I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick Darkness when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place. When it says, I said these things, it's, it's Jesus. This far you may come, he says to the waves. No further. I, I wonder how things might have been different if somehow the disciples would have been able to review that part of Scripture in their morning devotion that day. To see that picture of God and to be reminded of who it was that just happened to be sleeping on the cushion with them in that little boat. I don't know if you've read the book of Job lately. Um, it, it's a remarkable book. I, we, we were reading some of the parts of the book of Job together. Me and my daughter, we were coming back from Madison. We were looking at a used car. It's an hour and 50 minutes, so you can... You can get quite a ways in the book of Job. The, the poetry and, the, and, and the, the words that the Spirit led Job to, to weave together just reinforce how great and good our majestic God is. It also reminds us that since He is our God, we have to be careful how we question Him. Of course, the Bible is, is more than just a book of 
good literature, isn't it? It's, it's meant to show us our God, to show us who he is, to, re, to remind us of who we are. And again, it's, it's one thing when we have questions for God, when we go to him in prayer, he invites us, he even commands us to pray. The Bible's filled with examples of believers who were struggling and had questions and they asked God about them, they brought them to God, they cried out to God, he's big, he can handle that. But we need to be careful how we do that, how we question him. We certainly don't want to take him to court as Job and his friends were in his book and the disciples were in their boat. Does he care for you? Sometimes we really do want to know more about his care and love. At times all the evidence in the world seems stacked against our faith in him. Again, the Bible's full of people who've gone through those same things in life and had the same questions. Take them to the Lord. He's big. He can handle it. And that's what is happening in our text. You see, frail human beings struggling with circumstances around them, and they're crying out to the Lord. Have you ever heard someone, though, take it a little too far? And, and they'll say things like, God... Well, he let such and such a thing happen to me some years ago or to a loved one. And that's why I gave up on him a long time ago. Or they had a, a bad experience with his bride, the church. They said, I've given up on church altogether. I, I'm not even, I believe in God, but just don't want to have anything to do with the church. You hear people say things like that. And honestly, though, even the best of believers struggles, right? Circumstances in life, things happen in this beautiful world, and it becomes a scary place. Suddenly, things happen that, that pull the rug from right out underneath our feet. And things contradict everything we know and expect from a good and gracious God. Again, I'm just sitting at the picnic table yesterday. We have a graduation party for Summer Kerner, and again, talking with Michael Gurgis, and, and he just shared a story of how things went really bad one day in his life. When he was younger, one of his siblings, his 14-year-old brother, was up in the bedroom with his friends, and it was honey season, and they were just innoc innocently playing around with the shotgun, playing around with the pump action, and, and suddenly, unexpectedly, it went off. And suddenly, his... 14-year-old brother was gone. Again, things happen in this beautiful world of ours. We really turn it into a very scary place. At times like that, we need God to come to us because we have real questions and real fears. Our own family had something come home by us tragically. My, maybe you heard of how my son Tommy his girlfriend had taken her life. Things overwhelmed her. And I'll never forget when Tommy came home and he was just shaking at all of this stuff. And he couldn't stop shaking. He just said, Dad, could you pray for me? When things happen like this, we need God to come to us. We need him to strengthen us and, and to provide us with help and hope and an anchor for our souls to put us back on a sure foundation for our faith. And in his word today, he tells us again in no uncertain terms, your God, he cares for you. Through all the storms in life, God is there still, speaking through the, the silent whisper of his word. He comes to us, and there he shows us the perfect proof of his love in Christ Jesus. As in, when things happen in life, it, it, it should be obvious that God cares for us, but, but it's hard, so we need help. You want a perfect example today? of evidence that contradicts all the evident, evidence that 
goes against everything obvious, but then shows us God's love. Again, look no further than the second lesson from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. All the evidence of our conscience shows that well, we deserve God's judgment for our sins. It's all the evidence of nature, given that everything eventually ends in death. Reminds me that I'm not as, as good a person as maybe I thought I was. And that one day, unless Jesus comes again soon, I too will pay the wages of my own sin and I will die. But then God comes along in his word. And contrary to all the evidence, he gives his one and only begotten son to die for us. He receives everything that he didn't deserve. He's punished for our sins. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and, and he said, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There at the cross of Jesus, God clears things up. It's the surest sign of his love. Jesus takes on himself everything we deserved, and he sets us free, and he gives us his perfect life in, and righteousness in, in, our, in its place. Does your God care for you? The cross removes all doubts, all fears, and all questions. Yes, there at the cross, Paul said, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. And so in the end, yes, God does give us answers, and not just for ourselves but also for others. He's given us this message of, of sin and grace and hope and life, a message of reconciliation, that message that, that through Christ Jesus, sinners are brought back to God. We have that precious truth. We have answers. It's a beautiful place out there, but it's also filled with a lot of scary things and a lot of hurting people. People hurting because of sin in the world and sin that they committed themselves. And they need you to give them an answer for the reason that you have hope in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You can show them Jesus. And in showing them Jesus, his cross, his death and resurrection from the dead, you can show them that, yes, sin is a big problem, in the world, in your life, but Jesus is the solution to that problem. His life and death means we have hope here in this life and one day forever in heaven. We can tell everybody we meet, your God cares for you. He really does love you. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all human understanding, continue to guard and keep our hearts and minds in faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
may be seated. We bring forward our thank offerings to the Lord. <laughs> 